If you have a Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 26. That's where we're going to start. We'll do a little bit of jumping around uh, today, but um, Matthew chapter 26 is where we're going to jump in. And uh, while you're turning there, if you have um, you know, your Bible or if you're using your phone, um, or if you came, it's your first time and you've never been here before, you don't have a Bible, you don't have any of that kind of stuff, do not worry because we'll throw all the things that we'll read up on the screen. You can follow along, no problem. But um, before we get started, let me just pray. God, thank you so much uh, for the chance that we have to open your word together. And there's something significant about the words that are written in this book. They're alive and they bring life. They convict us, they challenge us, they inspire us in a way that nothing else can. No book ever written has the power, the weight, and the authority that your word does. And so God, I pray that as we jump into this, I pray that we would be challenged and that we would be encouraged, that we would grow and we would find new truths that help us to follow hard after you. We pray that you would do all these things for your glory. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. Well, um, many years ago, I used to work as a wrangler at a ranch in uh, southern New Mexico, and uh, it was really fun. It was a guest ranch, and so we had people come from all over the place uh, to visit, and you know, youth groups, and men's groups, and women's groups, and just kind of everything and anything in between. And, and I remember we had this one family gathering, and uh, there was this lady who uh, was short in her 70s. Uh, rotund, but um, very, very excited to go on a horseback ride. She, sa- she said, I remember when we were sitting at lunch, she said, I haven't ridden a horse since I was 16 years old. But she brought a cowboy hat and she had her cowboy boots and she was excited to go on a trail ride. And I was like, okay, my girl, let's do this. This is going to be amazing. And so the way a trail ride would work, we'd get, you know, 12 horses lined up, one for the wrangler that's going to lead the trail ride. We've got 10 horses for all the people in the middle. And then one person who brings up the back, which was usually me. Um, Because I was kind of like a fake wrangler, not a real one. So don't, don't don't get any impressions that I actually knew what I was doing. Um, And so uh, I remember we thought to ourselves, okay, you know, you try to pick the horse that's going to go with the person based on ability and experience. And so uh, we found this lady a horse that is the most docile horse in the whole world. It does not move fast. It doesn't do anything interesting. This horse was perfect. The little guy, right? And so, um, you know, we get her on her horse and everybody gets loaded up and we start going down the trail. And, you know, you chit chat and you're just kind of winding on single track. And as we got a little bit further in, a gust of wind had come by and it blew her cowboy hat off. And I was like, well, don't worry, don't worry, I'll get it. And so we had stopped and I jumped off my horse and I went and I grabbed her cowboy hat. And then as I was walking over to her, my horse spooked her horse, which is so rare. That doesn't happen with this horse, but my horse spooked her horse. And what had happened? You know how like when you're in traffic, And um, you have that rubber banding effect, you know, where everything compresses and then all of a sudden, like, this guy is texting on his phone even though he's not supposed to and he looks up and there's, like, a huge gap between him and who's in... Well, that's what happened in our trail ride. They had kept going and now there's a huge gap. And so what happened? That horse took off. It just started going. And I was like, oh, good. I jump on my horse and I chase after her. And there was a point in the trail where it took a hard 90-degree angle. So the horse went like this... And 72-year-old lady went like that. She went head first into a bush that had a cactus in the middle of it. And I remember getting, I called out to the, the other wrangler. He came, he stopped the trail ride. He came over and um, we got her pulled out of the bush. She was a wreck. It was just a mess. And uh, the wrangler just sharp on his mind. He was just like, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to take your horse. I'm going to lead everybody back to the camp. I need you to get her back to the road. And I was like, okay. And he's like, can you do that? I was like, absolutely. So he takes my horse, he leaves. And this lady can't be higher than five feet off the ground, 300 pounds, cannot walk. And I need to get her half a mile through this southeastern desert mountain terrain to the road so that our wrangler could pick her up in the truck and take her to the hospital. And I was like, okay, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to carry you. And she said, son. I was like, but it's okay. Because in high school, I used to be a wrestler. 
So even though I'm a small guy, I'm a lot stronger than I look, okay? And so then I, you know, bent down and I had her get on my back and I lifted her up. You know, you feel that burn in those quads and then you just start going and you start going and it's like every step, you're tripping over branches, but you're trying to stay up and she is in bad shape. We come to find out later on, she had actually broken her hip. And so every step was brutal as we were going along and, and, uh, and we're going, we get like halfway there and she's like, I just can't do this anymore. And in my mind, I'm like, I just can't do this anymore, but I gotta keep going, I gotta keep going. And, and, and like three quarters of the way there, it's just like, this is too much. I just can't do this. I, I can't carry her. And, 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 and yet, you can't give up, you know? But have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like that there's those moments where it's like, there's, this is just too much. This is too great of a weight to carry. Well, we're gonna look in that. That's my message title. If you're taking notes, you can go ahead and write that down. The title of my message today is, This is Too Much. I think we've all been there. We've all experienced the, the weight that can come down on us maybe not physically carrying somebody, but all of life's things that, that just come down. And, and I feel like Jesus, he was no stranger to this. He absolutely experienced this. In Matthew chapter 26, uh, we'll see that this is accumulation of a moment. Jesus, his entire life, he has been um, building up to this one moment where he recognized what was going to happen next. Jesus, he had spent his entire life building uh, people, building the church, building um, everything that was leading up into this moment. And then you see it all kind of climax in this passage. We'll read here in Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 36, it says this. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch just with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and he prayed for a third time, saying the same words again. This brings us to our first point. What is that? It is the burden, the burden. You get a sense of the burden that Jesus is carrying in this moment. We know what happens next, right? We know that from this point forward, he's going to be brutally murdered. And not only that, that's what you can see, but what, what's happening behind the scenes, the spiritual ramifications of what he's about to endure are massive because he is bearing the weight of everything wrong that we've ever done in our entire lives. Jesus walking into the most difficult thing that he will ever experience. And what was his response? What was, it was what he was in the habit of doing. He went to pray. Right, Walking into the most difficult thing he would ever walk into, this incredible weight bearing down on him. And what did he do? He went to go pray. Now, the, him and the disciples going into the gar garden of the Gethsemane to pray, that was not an abnormal thing. That was something that they would regularly do. But this time, it looked a little different. You know, it's easy for us when things get hard to go to anything that we can to ease the pain, right? It's easy, it's easy for us to look to other places, um, maybe if we just ignore the problem, the problem will go away, right? Maybe if we could just distract ourselves from the problem, right? I'll just keep working harder and then maybe I won't, I won't worry about the weight of the issue that's bearing down on me, it'll go away. Maybe if I could just numb the problem, then I won't have to experience the weight that I have to carry. But Jesus, he addressed the weight that he carried by, by bringing it to the Father, and it says here in verse 37, 
It says, taking with him the two sons, uh, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Now, I, I think it's interesting because when I think of Jesus, I don't typically think of Jesus being full of sorrow. I don't think of him being troubled. I think he's Messiah. He is the son of God. He is the fullness of joy everlasting, right? But to think about my savior, to think about my God being filled with sorrow is just an interesting feeling. But the thing was, he, he was carrying a lot. He had spent his entire life building people, the church, but in this moment, he's about to be torn down and the weight is compounding. The weight is accumulating. It's, and, and, and anticipation of what's about to happen is debilitating. I feel like, isn't that how it works sometimes? You know, what's the phrase? When, when, uh, when it rains, it storms. Did I say that right? No. When it rains, it pours. Sorry. John Mark, he, he's the one who always helps me correct all of my idioms that I get wrong. Um, yeah, when it rains, it pours, right? It seems like, you know, something bad happens, your, your car goes out, and, you're, and then you go to pay for it, and all of a sudden your account's overdrafted, and then all of a sudden, like, you know, um, your son puts a fork in the microwave, it explodes, and, you know, it's like, all, it's like when it rains, there's so much, it's all compounding. And, and the thing was that, that we are moments, we are minutes, just hours before Jesus is stepping in to this next part of the story, the next part of what he's going to experience. And it hits him so much so. So the disciples, right, going to the Garden of Gethsemane, this feels normal. This is where we go to pray and stuff. But they're sensing the fact that he is experiencing this sorrow. But then he, just to clarify, he says this in uh, verse 38. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Sorrow to death. I've heard of being scared to death, but being filled with sorrow to death, that's a, that's a significant burden. That's, that's the kind of burden that brings life to a standstill. That's the kind of burden that makes it hard to breathe, that makes you nauseous, that disables your focus, that makes you feel helpless, that makes it feel like it might kill you, makes it hard to even stand up from something like that. Significant burden. Luke puts it this way in chapter 22. It says, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. A little bit of stress, a little bit of anxiety. No, a lot, huge, huge burden. I remember in uh, 2018, watching the strongman competition, Mikhail Shilov, Shivlikov, um, getting ready to lift 940 pounds, okay? Almost half a ton, the deadlift. This guy, this beast of the man, gets in front of the bar, reaches down, grabs a hold of it, right? And he starts lifting. Imagine lifting half a ton. And, and the bar's rolling against his knees and his thighs, and he's struggling, and every inch that happens is this incredible amount of strength that he has to exert. And he, he looks up and all of a sudden, blood just shoots out of his nose. I mean, it just, it wasn't a drip. It just, it, and he just higher, higher, higher until he stood up and then he dropped it. And you can see the intense amount of pressure that had built up physically in his body to accomplish such a feat like that it was humongous right? That feat was a physical feat. What Jesus is experiencing in this moment is a mental, spiritual, and emotional feat, an emotional weight that he's carrying. So it's not his body that's trying to live this weight. No, it's his heart, his mind, and his soul. And so what happens, man, his, his sweat, the, the vessels in his head begin to burst and his sweat mixes with the blood and it drops to the ground, right? He's laying on his face on the ground, blood, drops of blood hitting the ground. And then he says this, probably the most genuine heartfelt prayer you've ever heard in your entire life. It says, he fell on his face and prayed saying in verse 39, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. 
nevertheless. I don't know what your Bible says, but go ahead and circle that word. It might say nevertheless, it might say yet, but circle that word because there's something important about that word. Not as I will, but as you will. Here you have Jesus, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit had established before time even existed what they were gonna do to rescue all of mankind, how they were gonna remedy what had been broken. And, and, and he knew the plan and he lived his whole life leaning into it. But then we get to this moment and, and now the rubber hits the road and he's laying on his face and knowing very well what's going to happen, he begs the father, if there's any other way, I don't wanna do this. I mean, imagine that. Imagine Jesus, the son of God, laying on his face and saying before going to the cross, I don't, I don't wanna do this. Is there any other way? I can't bear it. But then there's that word that shifts the whole thing. And what is that? Nevertheless, even if, yet not as I will, but as you will. And in classic Jesus fashion, dealing with the weight of the world on his back, he uses this opportunity to teach. In verse 41, he, uh, he gets up, he walks over to the disciples, and he tells them, he says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. In this moment, he's feeling his humanity. He's feeling the weight of, man, this is gonna hurt. Physically, this is gonna hurt. Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, I don't wanna do it, but my spirit, my spirit is willing. Then he goes back, he prays two more times, the exact same thing. And what happens? Jesus unlocks a power. Now, I love in movies where you have, you know, we're in the current scene that we're at, we're in the Garden of Gethsemane, but then like you have a flashback to a previous moment where it, it, it ties so perfectly into what's going on here. And this flashback actually goes back several chapters, 15 chapters to, to Matthew chapter 11. And this is Jesus. He actually was praying to his father. And he said, I love that I know you in a way that nobody else can know you. And I love that you know me in a way that nobody else can know me. There's a union that they have together. And I almost imagine if him wondering that what's about to happen next is the breaking of that. And he remembers this moment, right? And he tells everybody in the midst of his prayer. So he's praying, but then he kind of starts speaking to everybody. And he says this in verse 28, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. Come to me, all you, you who labor and are heavy laden. Heavy laden. I, I looked up just that phrase. It's an interesting phrase, right? It means heavily loaded or weighed down. What does it mean to weigh, be weighed down? Well, I think we're going to need some help. I got, I got my friend Chris. You might know him as the, uh, the campus pastor of our Kalispell campus here at Fresh Life. Also a fantastic human being in every sense of the word. Chris, Chris, yes, agree completely. Um, Chris, I picked to help me out today because he is very strong. And uh, he has demonstrated his strength uh, upon me several times in the past. In fact, there was one moment where I just attacked him to see what would happen. And he folded me into a pretzel. And um, it was humiliating, you know? Jesus uses each other to build each other up in the ways that maybe we might be weak. I needed some humility, and so God brought Chris into my life. Um, so thinking about this idea of what it means to be heavy laden, what it means to be weighed down, um, I, I, have, I have some things over here that um, I think could help kind of illustrate exactly what's going on. So, you know, these are weights, and, um, and each one of these weights represents something different, right? This one only weighs two and a half pounds. This is like when you, um, I don't know, your pencil breaks, 
and you can't find a pencil sharpener. And it's like, it's really unfortunate. You know, why are you even using a pencil? Do we even use those anymore? You know, like, but, you know, that's a weight you have to carry. It's like, that's unfortunate because now how are you supposed to finish writing your thing, you know? And then, and then we come over here and, and, and it's like, man, there's that moment where, I don't know, um, you know, you're trying to tie this thing onto somebody's vest while using a handheld microphone. And it's inconvenient, it's not fun, but you eventually get it on there, right? It's a, it's a weight that you're carrying. Uh, let's say we have, um, I don't know, Chris, what would you say is a, is a small weight in your life? Uh, you're hungry. Oh, oh. Would you say you're hangry? Some might call it that. Some might call it hangry, right? It's like, man, it's been a while since I had a meal, and it's kind of starting to weigh down on me. And then you have, um, you're hangry, but then there's just no food. And so, good luck with that. Have, have fun there, right? Um, but then there's like the things that start, you know, weighing a little bit more, you know? Um, I was, uh, I, you know, you have, you know, an embarrassing moment in front of a lot of people. And you're like, oh, I hope that doesn't fall off, you know? Because that would be, that, that would be embarrassing, you know? Um, that, would, that would be hard. Um, how about those moments where it feels like your world is just completely out of control? It's like, that's, that's not very fun. That's not, that's not exciting, you know? We don't like feeling out of control. It's a weight that we have to carry. Um, what about those moments where your bank account just isn't cooperating? You know, what's the phrase? A little bit too much month at the end of the money. Um, and you still have bills to pay. You still have things to get done, right? But you're just dealing with the strain of your finances. How about those times when you messed up real good and you feel the weight of how you messed up and you keep thinking about it, keep feeling like a failure, the strain in your relationships, maybe that, that spouse that you feel like you've been waiting for forever, you know, and you're like, God, what's going on? I don't think you called me to a life of celibacy, right? But this is, this is going much too long. How's that feeling, Chris? It's, it's getting there. It just keeps coming, right? Those moments where you feel inadequate, like you're just not enough, like maybe... If you would have tried harder, it would have worked out a little bit different. Those moments where you're lonely. How about when life didn't go the way that you planned it? This, this guy, this guy is uh, when life didn't go the way that you planned. And Chris earlier was like, where are we going to hang that one? said, we're going to hang it back here. Just like that. Just like that. And Chris was like, but the thing is, nobody's going to see that weight. I said, sometimes the heaviest weights are the ones that nobody can see. So you're sitting here. It's like, how long can you stand like that? You know? Like, at some point, it's just like, man, this is a lot to carry. This is a lot. So sometimes you just have to sit down. If you can.
And it's like when you have all this weight on you, it gets really hard to stand up. <laughs> oh, gosh. Let's just kind of put this back. Go ahead and sit back down. There you go. This is a significant way. It keeps piling on. It keeps piling on. It feels like this is just too much that I can't do this. And yet, Jesus promises that if you feel heavy laden, if you come to him, he'll give you rest. How exactly does that work? When you're tired, he says he'll give you rest. When, you're, when you don't have rest, you feel overwhelmed, probably don't sleep very good at night. You're physically tired, you're out of gas, you're out of strength, you don't have the desire to keep going. You want to give up because that would be easier than this. You want to abandon ship because being tossed in the sea would be better than what you're experiencing. And yet Jesus promises to give you rest. And how in the world is he going to do that? How? The most mystifying passage in all of scripture <laughs> where he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy, my burden is life, light. What a mystifying passage. What does that even mean? What am I, ox? To take a yoke on me? Like, how do you do that? What's the, what's the practical application here? How am I going to do something about that? And then you realize Jesus in the garden. Right? He, he this is our flashback, recognizing what the example that he would set, what he, the way that he would pay for us. When he said those words, nevertheless, Nevertheless, Jesus was carrying a significant burden and he had resolved that regardless of what happens, I will trust you. I will trust you. It's surrender, just not for defeat. It's for victory. It's not letting go, right? I, if you've been in the church world any number of years or whatever, you, you know, you hear the thing like, oh, just let go and let God. No, that's not what he says. What does he say? He says, take my yoke upon you. He said, you got to do something. I want you to carry something. You're like, what, you want me to carry something? Do you not see what I'm already carrying? You know, is it not already enough what I have? You know, he says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus did not let go. Instead, he took hold like he had never held before of what? The promises. Of what? of this, it's the promises, it's the promises of God. It's the promises of God. He took hold of every single promise that had been made before this point. The thousands of years and the hundreds of prophecies that started off in Genesis chapter three, where God said it will be his heel that, that, that bruises that serpent's head. And it went all the way up into this moment where, where the promise that, that he would be crucified, that he would be murdered like a criminal, even though he had never done anything wrong in his entire life. And the promises that existed beyond this point, right? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. He saw, he saw the promise after the problem. And what did the promises do? Well, the promises unlock the power of God. That's what this guy is. It's a hoist, but it's the promises of God. Jesus trusted the Father that, that these promises would be fulfilled, and it gave him the power to move forward. Jesus, he took hold of what he came uh, to do. He took hold of the destiny that was laid out before him. He took hold of your future. Every one of us in this room and these and online, uh, he took hold held of the promise. He took hold of his joy. And that gave him the power. It gave him the power so that when you're embarrassed, you see God's word says, so now there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. So when your world feels out of control, I'll go on this side. 
When your world feels out of control, you can remember that the Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And for those, of, and those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. What starts happening, right? So when you're discouraged, you can remember that uh, you don't need to be afraid for I am with you. Don't be discouraged for I'm your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. When you're dealing with financial strain, you can seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he'll give you everything that you need when you've messed up. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all wickedness. When you feel like a failure, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. If there's strain in your relationships, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach. Here's the thing I want you to see. Here's the thing I want you to see. When you take hold of the promises of God, it unlocks the power of God. And then we fast forward back to the Garden of the Gethsemane. Look at what happened. Jesus laying on the ground, dealing with such a weight that he was sweating drops of blood, begging the Father, if there's any other way, nevertheless, your will be done. Not my will, your will be done. Not what I want, but what you want. And then it says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 45, then he came to the disciples and he said to them, sleep and take your rest later. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Rise. How did Jesus get off the ground? Man, he trusted in those promises. He trusted the Father. And and as he trusted those promises, he was able to stand up. So then when you feel like you have a big decision in life to make. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best paths of your life. I will advise you and watch over you. If you feel inadequate, he gives you the, he gives strength to the weary. He increases the power of the weak. Uh, If you're lonely, God sets the lonely in families. If you're feeling sick, I am the Lord who heals you. When your life isn't going as planned, this I know that God is for me. Jesus did not give up and die. Jesus stood up to die. The weight didn't go anywhere, right? Father and the Holy Spirit didn't change their minds. No, it still happened. The only thing is the weight got a little lighter. How did the weight get lighter? He trusted the Father. So when Jesus says, hey, take my yoke upon you, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, Trust me. That's what that passage means. It's all about trust. Just that you would, you would recognize the fact that, man, even if this stuff doesn't disappear, I'm in his hands. It's the best place I'll be. Even if he doesn't heal my cancer, ultimately, when I walk in heaven, I will be healed. I will be made perfect, right? He, is, he promises he will deliver on the things that he promised us. He stood up. And then he called his disciples to do the same thing. And I think here in this moment, he's calling us to do the same thing. What are you carrying? What weights have been strapped to you that feel overwhelming? Weight upon weight upon weight. Is it a friend who passed away? Is it your finances? Is it your children, the burden that you carry for them? Is it that relationship is it, is it that thing that you wanted? All these things come bearing down. Jesus is calling us to what? To learn from him. Hey, I'm going to set an example for you. I want you to walk in it. I want you to be able to say, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. And what happens as you do that, as you trust these things in God's hands, man, it just gets a little lighter. It doesn't disappear. It just gets a little lighter so that you can stand and walk in what God has for you. I pray that you would do that. Go ahead and bow your head. Close your eyes. We'll pray together. God, I thank you so much for the example that you have given us in this. The ability to see you literally live out 
the greatest weight that any human being could ever carry. All of us dealing with so many difficult things, so many hardships. And you call us to just trust you. You said that your yoke is easy, your burden is light. We just need to take hold of it. And so God, I pray for everybody in this room, in our campuses, at our watch parties online, that this would be a moment where maybe if you've been holding on, that you would just let go. Like I said, it's, it's a surrender, not for defeat, but a surrender in victory. So if that's you, and you feel like maybe there's some weights that you've been carrying, some weights you've been holding on to, and you wanna just trust those in God's hand, then maybe just lift up your hand. You raise your hand up. It's an act of surrender, saying, God, nevertheless, I will trust you. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. I give you these things. I give you these weights. I give you these hardships. I pray that you would take hold of them and that you would allow me to stand and walk in the fullness of what you have laid out for me. That we would walk for the joy even set before us just like Jesus did. I pray that you would, you would do this in my heart, in my life, you would lighten my burden as I take on yours. I pray this in your name. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe you're carrying the weight of even your own life and you've never made that decision to just give your life to Jesus. Here is he who from this point would be wrongfully tried as a criminal, beaten, torn down, whipped, humiliated, paraded through the town, nailed to a cross to die of the death of a criminal. And if that's where the story ended, it would be really sad. But three days later, Jesus being fully God, he rose out of that grave, conquering death forever. And he did it for you. And he says, all, all you have to do to be able to experience that joy that he was looking forward to, all you have to do is believe in him. Believe that he was who he says he was. Believe that he died and believe that he rose from the dead. And if you do that, you trust even your life in his hands. And the Bible says you will be saved. You will have life. I want to give you an opportunity to do that now. If that's you and you want to, for the first time, trust your life in Jesus' hands, then just pray this prayer. Not magic words. It's just your heart before God. Just honestly, just say, God, I give you my life. I pray that you would take it and you would use it for your glory. Draw me close to you. Help me to live for you. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for rising from the dead in order to save me. Help me to live for you. I pray this in Jesus' name.